Shalom, and in this session, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 17. We're going to be talking about the transfiguration of the Messiah. This is one of, one of, the, one of my most favorite passages, the transfiguration of the Messiah. We're going to be talking about the demon-possessed boy, and we're also going to be talking about how Yeshua, Jesus, predicted his death again. Okay, so in order for us to really understand the transfiguration, um, we got to go. We got to back up a little bit. We got to we got to back up into Matthew chapter sixteen a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to start at Matthew chapter sixteen, verse twenty-four. But before I do, I want to let you know after, when I read this this passage. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you. I'm going to be um, telling you uh, what I personally experienced, okay? My own personal testimony in regards to this particular subject, the transfiguration of the Messiah. Let's start with Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself... Take up his cross and follow me. Now, again, I'm going to stop here for just a second. To understand exactly what he's talking about here, he's talking about denying yourself, which means deny all of your selfish ambitions, all of your will. You know, as Yeshua prayed in in, uh, the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done, Father. So deny all of your will, yourself, your... (laughs) Everything, your reputation, deny everything for him. Take up your cross. Now, again, you need to understand back in those days, the cross was not some decorative thing that, you know, somebody had uh, hanging on the wall or some uh, somebody had hanging around their neck in a necklace. The cross was an instrument of execution. Some One of the most... One of the most horrific forms of e- execution in the history of mankind. So this is a very, very serious thing. When Jesus said you gotta take up your cross, he was talking about he was talking about a horrific public display of, uh, uh, of humility, death. I mean when someone died on the cross they stripped them of their of their clothes. They they died beaten, uh, bloody, bloody like you never like like as we see Jesus died without even his bones being broken. Um, just from bleeding to death, just like a raw piece of meat hanging up on a cross. And, uh, you know, it was um, very horrific, very horrific form of execution. And it was done publicly, okay? Jesus and nobody had this little th- thing tied around their waist. No, they didn't. It w- there was a public display of humiliation and of uh, really just he- massive punishment. Horrific punishment. So when Jesus said, if you want to come after me, and this is so many people claim that they go after Jesus anymore. So many people claim to be Christian, but they do not deny themselves. They don't take up a cross, so to speak, figuratively speaking. And they don't really follow him. They don't really do what he did. They don't really, they don't really ask themselves like how, you know, back in the Back in the 90s, there was this kind of fad that was out in, in some Christian circles. You know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I don't know if any of, any of you uh, remember that or not, but uh, I know some of it might be still in uh, in in today with, with some people. You know, the WWJD bracelets or the WWJD, you know, uh, ornaments or whatever it is that, that people would wear. Um, necklaces, bracelets, and so on and so forth. WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's following him, doing what he would do, taking him, taking Yeshua as your example in life, okay? So in order to do that, you got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross. You got to you got to be willing to face the most horrific public display of humiliation ever. I, it's the opposite of pride, by the way. Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Again, he's focused on losing your life, dying, okay? Dying for, for him. And not necessarily literal, physical, you know, biological death, but more or less death to yourself, denying yourself completely, utterly. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? 
it, it wouldn't profit you anything to be the most, the richest, most wealthiest person on earth and yet lose your soul. Life is short. Oh, or, or what will a man give in exchange for his life? You can't buy this. You can't, you can't buy this kind of stuff with money or wealth, any kind of wealth. Verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will render to everyone according to his grace, faith? No. He says exactly what's going to happen in the end of the days. He says exactly what's going to happen come judgment day. He's going to render to everyone not just to the world and not just to the sinner, no. To everyone according to his deeds. By the way, God does not have double standards. He doesn't have a law for this person and a different law for that person. He's got one law, which is a reflection of his character, his ways. He is one. He's not divided. He doesn't, he doesn't have multiple personalities. He's got one way. He is not a hypocrite. He doesn't have a double standard. Okay? Uh, so he's got one way and he renders to everyone according to that way, his way, his word, his law, according to their deeds, our deeds. Verse 28, most certainly I tell you, there are some standing here. Now this is the key phrase that leads us into Matthew 17. Most certainly I tell you, there are some standing here, who will in no way taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what was he talking about in no way taste of death? Was this, again, biological death, death to the physical body, the biological body, the material body, or was this death to self? Okay? I believe it could mean either or, uh, but... God is more focused on the the spiritual. He's more focused on the things that are happening in your heart, in your spirit, okay? I tell you, there are some standing here, okay? He's talking to his disciples and others. Some standing here who will in no way taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Again, this phrase, in his kingdom, is talking about the rule and reign of that king. Ruling and reigning, okay? Now, go over to Matthew chapter 17, and this is what he's talking about, okay? You need to realize, in the original manuscripts, in the original book that was actually, the original book of Matthew that was actually written, as far as we can tell, it was not written with chapters, verses, okay? It was written in one long, continuous document, from beginning to end. So there was there were no division between this chapter and that chapter. It, you know, man added these divisions later on, you know, chapters, verses, and so on. Uh, by the way, did you know that verses actually uh, comes from the idea of a song? Because, you know, the uh, ancient Jewish way of reading the scriptures, and even today, you see in synagogues, uh, Jewish synagogues, what they do is when they read the scripture, especially reading the Torah, they would sing it, okay? So uh, it, it's a way of really, um, you know, uh, adding, uh, what should I say, adding dynamics and depth and, and, and really adding value, if you, if you will, to the scriptures by really singing the scriptures, okay? Showing uh, God how much it really means to you by singing it. Um, as opposed to just saying it, okay? Uh, so, verses, the whole idea of verses comes from that idea. Is that it was sung, okay? So, most certainly, most certainly I tell you, this is again the last verse of Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said, most certainly I tell you, there are some standing here who, own, who will in no way taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Then, right after that, Without a chapter break in the original, without without a verse break in the original, it says, now in our Bible, it's Matthew chapter 17 now, verse 1, after six days, okay? So this is like after six days. This is like the seventh day, or at least the sixth day, depends how you look at it. After six days, 
Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them up into a high mountain by themselves. Again, here we see Yeshua. Here we see Jesus taking Peter, James, and John out from among the twelve to be with him in a real, personal, intimate setting. Okay? Uh, As I said before, this is a... This is evidence that Peter, James, and John knows the Lord in ways that the other nine did not know him. Okay? And then, may I add, the twelve, Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John, and the other nine, they knew the Lord much more than others did. You know, like Timothy or Silas or uh, even Paul for that matter, okay? Um, just because Paul wrote a lot of books doesn't mean that he actually knew more than the 12 disciples. It's obvious the 12 disciples were with him, with the Lord, I should say, a whole lot more than Paul was ever with the Lord. In fact, we don't have any evidence that Paul even saw the Lord in the flesh, personally. Uh, we don't have any evidence that Paul even said one <laughs> one word to Jesus uh, face-to-face, humanly speaking, okay? So take that into account. Peter, James, and John know more than the, than the rest. And may I say that John was the closest of Peter, James, and John. So he would know, he would know Jesus even more than Peter and James, okay? That's why we see the book of John and the books of John. It is very, the way it's written and what is said in those books are very, very uh, special and different than the rest of the New Testament uh, documents. Okay, so John is at the the height. Okay, the 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 top of the hierarchy, if you would, the top of the uh, of the knowledge base, if you would, of the Lord. Okay, John's at the top. So you want to know what Jesus is like. You want to know Jesus. You want to know the Lord more than anybody. First of all, we read the words in red. Okay. Second of all, read John's books. Read all of John's material. And then, once you get that down, read the material of Peter and James. Okay. You're going from the most to the least. Okay. And then after you get that down, read the, the works of the other apostles. Again, and after that's all down, and after all of the previous scriptures like the Torah, the Ketuvim, the Nevim, the prophets, the scriptures, that kind of thing. After you get all that down, then read the books of Paul, okay? Because you got to take this into context. You can't just read the book of, you know, the books of Paul and know them more than you know Isaiah or Deuteronomy. If you know the books of Paul more than you know Deuteronomy, you've got it backwards. You've got that cart before the horse, okay? So Peter, James, and John, again, was taken out among from the, all, of the, all of the other disciples, singled out. And they were given the privilege and the honor of coming up to the, to the top of the high mountain by themselves with Jesus. Verse 2, he, speaking of Yeshua, Jesus, was changed before them, or it says here, transfigured. Transfigured is, he is, his whole substance, you know, in a scientific, you know, explanation, you say, excuse me, molecular, molecularly speaking, if there's such a word or such a term, it was absolutely, he was changed in from just a typical human. He was changed into something else, okay? More than just transformed, transfigured. He actually changed nature, okay? He was changed before them. His face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as the light. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my own story, my own testimony, which a lot of you, but maybe all of you, um, have never heard this before. See, back in my darker days, back in my more, you know, foolish days and darker days when I used to be, you know, uh, what should I say, 
in the land of restriction. And, you know, if I was uh, back in the days before I was really, really born again. I used to hang out with some people who were, you know, very secular people, people who were unbelievers. Some of them would call themselves believers, but they certainly didn't live a holy life by any means. And I was involved in a band. Uh, I was involved in music. I would play guitar. I would do some singing. And uh, had a, we had a band, and we had a lot of things, you know, it, from a worldly, secular perspective, we had a lot of things going for us. And, uh, you know, I mean, we had a... We had a, a a tentative contract in in uh, that was uh, uh, basically tentatively uh, booked, or we were invited, I should say, to uh, to Hollywood for a recording contract. So uh, we, not only did we have music, we had all the friends we could ever ask for. You know, as guys, you would have all the girls you would ever ask for. You'd have all the other stuff you could ever ask for. Okay. Um. You fill in the blanks, okay? With this kind of lifestyle, there's a lot of stuff that comes with it, okay? Then I got, then I came to the knowledge of the truth and I became, I got born again, okay? Now, when I got born again, there was a few people in my life that was really instrumental uh, to this whole process. There was a few people in my life that was that was very that was very good examples for me. Uh, you know, one was my grandmother, another one was a friend of mine, another one was a, was a distant cousin of mine, and, and these people would teach me, you know, by example and by word. You know, it's not right to be a Christian and to be you know involved in this secular lifestyle. It's not right to be a Christian and to be, you know, drinking or drugging or smoking or sleeping around or all this kind of stuff. It's not, it's not right. It's, it's sinful and you need to repent from that. So, uh, what happened was, um, I saw my, one of my, one of my friends got completely changed, you know, um, at least changed. I mean, it was an amazing change. He was one of these guys that was right into the music scene. He was right into the party scene. He was right into all this, you know, and he left, he left the party atmosphere. He left all of his old friends and he threw out all of his own music. And, you know, the rumor had it that he, that he, that he threw out, it literally threw out, literally trashed, uh, over $3,000 worth of things. And these, this was back in 1991. Okay. So $3,000 would have been worth a lot more than it is today. But it was worth a whole lot. It was worth a whole lot in those days, and it was just a huge. It was like shaking. It was one of these guys that hung out with the with the rest of the crowd, you know, and it just kind of shook. Um, it shook everybody. Like, wow, this guy. He he already did. Like, you know, and he kind of gave up partying. He gave up smoking. Gave up, you know, he quit smoking. He quit drinking. He quit smoking up he he quit hanging out uh, uh and he threw out all this music stuff and t-shirts and all this stuff that, like three thousand dollars worth of stuff like wow so i came from that kind of an atmosphere where i had several people like this in my life that really was an a, instrumental in helping me to come to the knowledge of the truth and an example to me of how to live a real, true, holy Christian life as it's, as it's spelt out in, in the scriptures. So not long after I got born again, one of my friends approached me on the street. And he said, he said, he, he said hey, I, I, got, uh, I, had a, I had a dream of you last night. I had a dream of you last night. And I'm not going to tell you what it was that I dreamt. I'm just not going to, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it was. However, I'm going to tell you this. It's a warning from the Lord. Don't go back to the old crowd. Don't go back into another, to the, to a situation where they're all drinking again. Like, you know, going to a party or going to a home where they're all sitting around drinking. He said, don't get back into that kind of atmosphere. This is a warning of the Lord I had in a dream last night for you. So I took it very seriously. Shortly after that, within a matter of days, okay, um, there was another person that used to be, like, there was another person that was my old friend uh, from the dark days, okay, from my old friend, uh, and uh, I always told him, you know, after, especially after I got born again, I always told him, I said, hey, 
anything, anytime you need anything, no matter what time it is, you know, come on over to my place. I'll help you no matter what you need. Okay. You know, you know whatever you need, I'll, I'll help you out. Okay. Just come. doesn't matter if it's three o'clock in the morning, whatever, just come on over. I will be there for you. Well, lo and behold, one day he came up to my door and it was like 11 o'clock at night. Okay. And he said, he said, hey, man, you know, I come on over to my place. And you only live like a block over or so, right? He said, come over to my place. You know, I need to talk to you about something, right? So I said, okay. So I went over there. Now, you need to understand here, just to keep this in, in context as well. At this time in my life, I was spending a lot of time in prayer, a lot of time in, in just listening to worship uh, music, uh, praise music, into the scriptures, reading the scriptures. And I really sensed a real rich presence of God in my life, you know, sensing his, his peace and his beauty and his glory. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful walk in the Lord that I had uh, at that time. And so, you know, back again to this night that this, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my old buddy there from the dark days came over to our, to my place and knocked at my door at 11 o'clock at night and said, come on over to my place. I need you. I need to talk to you. I'm thinking, okay, well, you took me up on the offer. I mean, I offered him how many times I said, you know, whatever you need, if you need anything, come on, come over to my place. Now I'll, I'll give you whatever, you know, I'll help you out and whatever you need. So I went over to his place and lo and behold, lo and behold he was sitting, uh, in his kitchen with another one of my old uh, one of the one of the guys that I used to hang around with, actually one of the one of the band members that I used to be uh, when I was in the band, um, and uh, this guy was a uh, uh, part of the band that I used to be in that I left ever you know when I got uh, when when God called me, you know because when you when you get called by the Lord when you re, when you respond to the voice of the Lord you gotta come out from among them it says that very very clearly in the scriptures come out from among them and be separate says the Lord then I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters so I came out from among the old crowd I came out from among the band okay so anyway at this guy's place he was sitting there in the kitchen and, there, and, the, and he was drinking he was like um he was pretty drunk. And this guy that was in that I used to be in a band with, he was drinking and he was, you know, he was it was late at night and he was, you know, this whole scene. And basically they they I sat down with him. Of course I didn't do any kind of drinking or smoking or anything, which they were all doing, and, and immediately I start I, I thought of that warning that I got from my old buddy, or not my old buddy, but the friend of mine that said that he had a dream about me. Um and I thought about that. I thought, you know, the Lord says don't go back into an atmosphere where they're like this, where they're drink, sitting around drinking and, and, and partying and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, man, here I am in this atmosphere that this guy warned me. And I really took it as, and I believe it was, the, the warning. Uh, it was a warning from the Lord. And so I'm thinking, I was really, really not comfortable at all. And so these guys, they were saying to me, man, you know, we really need you back. You know, we really need you back to the band. We really need you back in the band. You know, we can't do we can't do it without you. We can't make it without you. You know, we just we need you. We need you, man. We need you. Come back to the band. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I've just got my mind on the Lord. And so I said to them, I said, okay, I will come back on one condition that everything we do is to the glory of God. Every song we sing is to the glory of God. You know, when I started saying that, they were like. Uh, I'm like, well, okay. Well, like, and so to make a long story short, I left the place. I was there maybe an hour or two. I'm not sure how long I was. I left the place and they did not take me up on my offer. Uh, how, however, they were begging me to come back to be with them. And uh, I went back to my place and I tell you, I felt really, really, really drained spiritually. I felt for the first time and, you know, since I got born again, for the first time I felt empty, dry. I felt like, it was like, God, where are you? Where is you? Where is your presence? Oh, Lord. Like, I'm just like, oh, I was just in agony. 
I don't feel your, pre- I don't know your presence anymore. Like, where's your presence? Where are you, Lord? Where are you? I've, I felt such a, a fullness and, a, and, and peace and a glory all, the, all these many days, weeks, and, and, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, it's gone now. Is that because I was in this atmosphere that I was warned not to go in? But I didn't really, I was, basically, I was, innocent. I innocently went there, didn't, I didn't expect it, you know, I didn't, I wasn't expecting to walk into an atmosphere like that where, you know, my, you know, the, the whole scene, I didn't expect that at all. I was expecting, you know, my friend, you know, my old buddy from the dark days to say, oh, I need help from me or something like that. But no, he was like, he, you know, was basically like trying to get me back into the old scene again. I felt horrible. I felt horrible. I was like, God, where are you? Oh, God, I'm just praying and praying and praying. And I just didn't, I could not find relief from the dryness, the spiritual dryness, the the emptiness. And it was like, oh, I was just in agony spiritually. God, don't leave me. I was like, you know, um, David prayed in Psalm 51, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Oh, I was just... uh, Hours went by. Hours went by. I finally fell asleep. <laughs> I fell asleep without that same fellowship that I knew before, that same presence and glory and peace that I knew before. And that, I fell asleep and I woke up in the morning the same way, feeling the same way, feeling horrible, feeling bad, feeling like, God, you left me. Jesus, you left me. And I remembered what I heard a preacher say once, you know, in, in, you know, when you are in your darkest times, when you are pressed very, very hard, um, that is when, if you really hang on to God and you really press into God, that's when God can break through in a very powerful way. So anyway, uh, in spite of the fact of feeling horrible, feeling bad, feeling like God left me, feeling like it was just... Really bad feeling. Um, feeling alone. Um, in spite of that, I opened up the scriptures. I was sitting on my bed. I opened up the Bible to Revelation chapter 1. And I had the window open. And it was in the morning, I believe. Uh, yeah, it was in the morning. I had the window open. And I was reading how John experienced the Lord. I was reading how it says that when the Lord appeared to John, his face shone as bright as the sun in all of its strength. And I read that, and I had some music playing in the background. And I'll tell you exactly, I know a lot of you would probably wonder what kind of, what, what song I was listening to. You know, but I, not that it was the actual song in itself, but I was listening to um, Jesus, your presence makes me whole. The chorus of this, this gentleman was just singing it over and over again. Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence makes me whole. And I was reading the scriptures, Revelation chapter 1, how the, the Lord's appearance when he, when he appeared to John was like the sun shining in all of its strength wasn't some humanly, you know, wasn't some of these, like you see in these paintings where Jesus comes and, you know, just has a white garb on and he's got a halo around his head. No, no, that's not what it says in, in Revelation. It says his face was like the sun shining in all of its strength. And at that time, like I said, I had my, my, my window open and the sun was shining in and I was sitting on my bed and I was reading this and I'm listening to the, the music and I thought, you know, Lord, your your presence, not your presence, but your you appeared to God to John, and your face was like the sun shining in its strength. And I thought, let me let me just look at the sun, and I need to understand what this scripture is all about. And this is what this whole this is what this this whole you know series that I'm doing is all about, just so that we could understand. You and I to understand the scriptures deeper. So I thought, oh Lord, your presence, your your 
you appeared to John, and your face was like the sun shining in all its strength. Let me see how bright the sun is again. So I had to kind of stoop down a little bit because the sun was like shining kind of like on my chest and wasn't shining on my face, but it was on my on my chest. And and so I kind of looked down because, again, I was, picture this. I'm sitting on my bed, the window and the sun shining in. And I looked at the sun and I heard the music playing and I looked at the scriptures where John said that he fell like a dead man in by the glory of, you know, just by, just because the glory and the presence of God was so strong. And it says his, his face was like, was like the sun shining in strength. I looked again, I bent down a little again, I looked at the sun. And all of a sudden, it was like I saw him. And I tell you something. Tears just started popping out of my eyes. I had to gra- grab tissue and I had to start mopping up the tears. After spending a whole night in spiritual dryness and not experiencing the presence of God and the glory of God, all of a sudden, he came to me like this. All of a sudden, I saw it. His son, his face was like the sun shining in all the strength. I looked again at the sun and then I read the scriptures and I hear the music playing. Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence makes me whole. And I, and, and, and I saw it. Verse 2 of Matthew 17. He was changed before them. His face shone like the sun. My friends, my brothers and sisters, this is the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is what he was talking about in the last verse of Matthew chapter 16. This is the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It's the most beautiful thing you'd ever, 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 ever see. I wept so much. Tissue after tissue after tissue after tissue. Minutes went by. I don't know how many minutes, I don't know how many hours <laughs> I was weeping. You never want to leave. You never want to leave. There's nothing on earth like it. Not even worth, not even, it's, no. You take all the gold in the world, take all the money in the world, take all the riches, take all the wealth, take all the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, whatever you want to say. That is filth compared to glory, the glory of God. If you need to, if you haven't experienced it, you need to experience it. Verse 2, he was changed before them. His face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as the light. I was so happy. I was so incredibly happy when, when, when I experienced that. And I can't say I have ever since then, and it's been over 20 years, well over 20 years, 25 years, since I experienced that. I can't say that I've ever felt dry again. I can't say that I've ever felt like Jesus left me again. Can't say I've ever felt it. I can say the night before I experienced that, it was a horrible dry night, very horrible. 
So if you're going through a, a dryness right now, if it feels horrible in your life, if you need the presence of God, the glory of God, just hang in there. Pray. Like it says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Press into God. Even if it's like Jacob where it's like, Yaakov, where you got to say, Lord, I am not letting go of you all night until you bless me. Yeah, you've got to you got to press in. You've got to be like that. It says that you, that if you seek him with all your heart. Okay? There's the condition. There is the condition with all your heart. Don't have one part of your heart on the games, the music, the things, the people, the friends, even the family members. But if you seek him with all of your heart, all, you will find him. That's what it says in the scripture. You'll find him. If you seek him with all of your heart. Verse 2, again, he was changed before them. His face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as the light. Behold, look, look, take notice. Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Moshe and Eliyahu, their Hebrew names. Moshe and Eliyahu appeared to them talking with them. Peter answered and said to Jesus, verse 4, Look, it is good for us to be here. Oh, yeah, you'll be saying the same thing if you saw that. Oh, yeah, trust me. Oh, it's good for us to be here if you want. Let's make us three, let's make three tents here. One for you, Yeshua, one for you, Jesus, one for you, Yeshua, one for Moshe, and one for Eliyahu. Let's live here. So obviously Moshe and Eliyahu appeared in a very physical form along with Yeshua. Otherwise, they wouldn't be thinking about actually living on the mountain, making tents for you know and living there. It wasn't just a spiritual thing, it was a real physical experience. Verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Even as we read the scriptures, may God do that to some of you. May you have an experience that you'll never I will recover from in a very good way. Okay, so verse 6. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll fall, you, you'll fall on your face all right. No doubt about it. I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. <laughs> you'll fall on your face. And we're very afraid. Verse 7. Jesus came and touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. Lifted up, lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus alone. Again, this is very, very similar to what John reported in the book of Revelation chapter 1. Yochanan, John, reported this. This is very, very similar to what I just explained to you. Verse 9, as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, don't tell anyone what you saw. Again, 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 again. How many times did Jesus say, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone? He's not like a lot of the preachers today. Go tell everybody, don't, go tell everybody what God has done through my ministry. Go tell everybody, go testify to the glory of God. Make it sound good, right? Jesus said, shh. you saw don't tell anybody what you saw until the son of man has risen from the dead i dare say that jesus trusted peter james and john 
I dare say that uh, Peter, James, and John were trustworthy people and they didn't say anything until after Jesus rose from the dead. Verse 10. His disciples asked him, saying, Then why do the scribes say that Eliyahu must come first? Elijah must come first. See, that's what the scriptures say. And the scribes are the ones that copy the scriptures. Verse 11. Yeshua answered them, Eliyahu indeed comes first and will restore all things. But I tell you that Eliyahu has has come already. And they didn't recognize him, but did to them whatever they wanted to. Even so, the Son of Man will suffer by them. Verse 13, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. Verse 14, when they came to the multitude and a a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers grievously, for he often falls into the fire and and often into the water. So I... So I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Jesus answered, Faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I be with you? How long will I bear with you? Bring him here to me. You see, again, Jesus held the prayer responsible, not the prayee, okay? Jesus held his disciples responsible for the lack of faith and not the ones that were, you know, not the man or the boy that was supposed to be receiving the miracle, okay? So Jesus rebuked the demon and it went out from him. He went out, went up, and it went out of him and the boy was cured from that hour. Verse 19, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why weren't we able to cast it out? He said to them, because of your unbelief. Most certainly I tell you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, the NU manuscripts, the what many uh, scholars consider to be the oldest manuscripts, do it, 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 they... Those manuscripts do not include verse 21, okay? So, take it with a grain of salt. Verse 21 could have been added later, okay? It might not have been the original the original uh, words of, of the Lord. So, take it, as, take it for what it is. Albeit, it's here. Let's read it, okay? Verse 22. While they were... While they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. They were exceedingly sorry. Okay, So, you see, the disciples knew what Jesus meant by the Son of Man, and they knew that Jesus was referring to himself. And once again, the the Jewish understanding of son of man is, you know, comes from the Hebrew ben Adam, which means son of Adam or seed of Adam, which is a direct reference, direct um, indication of the Messiah. Okay, so the disciples understood that Jesus was talking about himself, which he was calling himself the the Messiah, the Mashiach. Verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, Capernaum, which is Kafer Nahum in the Hebrew, that's village. Kafer means village. Nahum, which means Nahum, the village of Nahum, the prophet. Those who collected the didrachma coins came to Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the didrachma? He said, yes. Now here in the notes, a didrachma is a Greek silver coin worth two drachmas. About as much as two Roman denarii, or about two days' work, uh, two days' wages. It was commonly used to pay the half shekel temple tax, because two drachmas were worth one half shekel of silver. A shekel is about ten grams, or about zero point three five ounces. 
Continuing with verse 25, when he came into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth receive toll and tribute or tribute? From their children, from their children, or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Peter's, uh, excuse me, Jesus said to him, therefore, the children are exempt. But lest we cause them to stumble, go to the sea, cast a hook, and take up the first fish that comes up. When you have opened its mouth, you will find a stator coin. And here again in the, in the um, notes, it says a stator is a silver coin equivalent to four Attic or two Alexandrian drachmas or a Jewish shekel. Just exactly enough to, co- to cover the half shekel temple tax for two people. A shekel is about 10 grams or about 0.35 ounces, usually in the form of a silver coin. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Okay. So that concludes the reading of Matthew chapter 17. What a wonderful reading that was. uh, And um, may uh, everything that we read here and talked about here be a blessing to you. May God uh, enrich your understanding and open the eyes of your heart, your understanding, and give you great revelation above all your peers. Make sure you share this video. Make sure you share it. I know we shared. We went through a lot of awesome things here in this video. We went. We went through an, a, a lot of awesome things here in, in this session. Share this video right now, and uh, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And check back again very soon because we are going to be doing Matthew chapter eighteen next. Thanks for watching, and God bless.